This is the Detroit Sports Podcast Network. The biggest, the biggest icon in podcasting. Welcome in, everybody, to this week's edition, a holiday edition of the Detroit Sports Podcast. This is Doc and Jock. I am the Doc, John Macaroon, joining me on this festive day. I look forward to a great sports conversation. My cousin Adam, the Jock Strozinski. What's up, cuz? What's happening? I'm looking forward to this broadcast. Happy birthday! Isn't that how the Frosty song starts? Happy birthday? <laughs> it always oh, makes man. me laugh the way it starts. But Merry Christmas! Merry Christmas to you! Merry Christmas to, to everybody in your family! Uh, I just want you to know we've made it to another year, and I appreciate you. I appreciate all the hard work you do. I appreciate doing this podcast with you. I, I've got to know. I've got to check in from last week. Have you Have you even started Christmas shopping yet? Yes, just prior to this recording. Uh, so finally, uh, half of the workload has been lopped off. I'm still going to cover the Lions. Uh, it's a 24-365 job, but that's just really, to me, it's not a job. Covering football, talking sports, talking shit, that's not even considered work. I love doing it. I could just wake up and do it because I love it. It's just, it entices everything about me, as you can tell. But finally, it just took a little time from the practice now until the beginning of next year. And so the wife got excited, and she's like, all right, I'm taking the day off. And so I headed out to the mall on Wednesday, and, man, was it packed. Everybody was out. Everybody seems to be kind of slowing down on vacation. Uh, the wife definitely deserved the shopping trip. Now, did she wreck my bank account like I posted on Twitter? Absolutely. She took advantage, and it was great. It was worth it. I joke around about it, but I wouldn't do it if she didn't deserve it. I mean, she puts up with me. I'm gone long hours. She's keeping this household intact. And it's the least I could do is just uh, bust open the, the checkbook and let her buy whatever the hell she wanted. And it was fun to do. Um, first time to spend like that. She wrecked the checkbook, but she deserved it, no doubt about it, because I could tell she ain't definitely wasn't with me uh, for the money when I was uh, a kid at 29 years old. I was a psychologist at a mental health clinic. And uh, we raised a family, and she's a, a definitely a strong lady. The yang to my yang. So I got out to the malls, but, bro, everybody's a little crabby, feisty. I mean, an hour wait at most restaurants. We went to Starbucks, just wanted to chill out a little bit. And, you know, there was like a 40-minute wait for mobile orders, which the lady kept screaming. And we got there. It was like five, ten-minute wait for just walking up. But everybody was crabby. And I'm like, oh, my God, I'm so thankful myself personally. I'm not a complainer. I'm somebody that just goes with the flow laughs a little bit at those that are just all uppity and like all crabby. So we got, we had an opportunity to get out to the malls. I got some stuff done, but a lot of things not available. So we're looking at it now. I guess maybe the 22nd is not the best day to start. Maybe, you know, five days earlier around the, the 15th to the 20th I'll start. But we're going to Amazon a couple things. But I got a lot of stuff done. And most importantly, took care of number one, the wife. She's happy. And, boy, when your wife is happy, let me tell you, it's the secret. I got a fresh cooked meal. She's smiling ear to ear. And she's like, oh, you want a podcast with Adam? Go ahead. Talk for two hours, three hours. <laughs> usually it's like, usually it's like, okay, you said 30 minutes, so you better not go two hours like you always do. Just go 30 <laughs> to 45 so that you can watch the kids so I can go upstairs. and like, oh, my God, what words am I going to use? I know I talk long. So now she's like, podcast as much as you want. I feel like I bought myself 14 days clear of the doghouse, and I'll take it. <laughs> That's great. It always surprises me how long you wait and how yeah. how long you procrastinate Jesus. to go buy gifts. It's so. but it's, it's fun because there's, that's where the action is. There's a lot of people. There's energy. Everyone's out and about, and I think it's the best way to do it. But nowadays, the problem lies in you kind of then end up without the supply because everybody's taking everything mm -hmm. and 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 everybody's there. There's a lot of people shopping. And for me, it's nice because I don't typically get out and about. I work a lot of a lot of hours, so to see all those people is exciting for me. But then at the same time, too, you're then you're, you're the back of your mind is like, are these people? You know, half of them wearing masks, half of them not. COVID. I masked up. You know, stayed safe. But for me, it's just changing the flow, and it's nice. Look, you procrastinate, you do those things, 
But, yeah, I probably have to go five days earlier. I can't go last, last, last minute. It's not the smartest thing to do. I don't recommend anybody doing it if you're out there. But I'll It's funny. This. You say it every year, though. Every year yeah, you say yeah. the same thing. I got yeah. to I gotta do it I gotta sooner. Do it. I got to do it by, like, the 20th. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I end up doing the 22nd, 23rd, and, and things like that. But it's great. It's, you know, the holiday time, it's festive. I'm happy. Sports world, what happened? All of a sudden, the light switch turned on, and the Pistons won, Red Wings won, Lions won. And everybody is, you know, feeling a little bit more festive. And it really does. It, it, it's true. And, and articles have been written. I don't know if you've ever seen it. But they've done studies that says that cities and uh, uh, fans and teams that are in cities that win are just happier people. And it's so true. Everyone kind of following a Lions win, they're just like, you know, and, and people are fun with it. Because I know you, you're online as much as I am. People are like, this is great. We have a culture. This is a signature mm. win. <laughs> and, 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 and I'm like, okay, I'm just going to fucking buy into the hype. I know cognitively what's really happening. People that, that you're listening, just to, I don't want to, you know, shit in your coal and, and shit in your stocking, but I want to tell you this, 30 to 40 of the players on this roster are not going to be here. They found 10. They're gone. I don't really believe in momentum year to year being that you're going to lop. This year was just get through the year. You're lopping off 40% of the roster. So I understand the culture, and it's a lot of advertising being done by Dan Campbell to say, hey, it's fun. But next year, you're going to have free agents. You're going to have a lot, a whole new roster turnover. You're going to have seven new draft picks. So, guys, relax a little bit. You're not the next coming of the Saints and the Packers. You have to, number one, before you even consider thinking about what this game meant against the Cardinals, you have to know who your quarterback is. And with Jared Goff, you have to build like a stellar uh, receiving core that gets open and, and you're going to pound the rock. This is what it is. But the blessing of that win, and we're going to talk all about it, is that I don't take too much of it meaning moving forward. But the good thing is, is that, okay, maybe this Lions organization is building an identity. Pound the ball, run the damn football, and do it to your heart's content. And we can do it with Craig Reynolds. We can do it with Jamar Jefferson. We can do it with Godwin Iguibuke. We can do it with Jamal Williams. We can do it with DeAndre Swift. What has impressed me is potentially, we've always said this throughout the course of the seven years of this podcast, plug and play. It's looking like, hey, maybe with an offensive line with Anthony Lynn teaching the protections and the runs with Ben Johnson working on the pass game, maybe this formula of, of, of cooperation under Dan Campbell, can produce an offense that pounds the rock. But also, too, you have to recognize there is value given. And I wrote it on my predictions. You have to see, too, teams coming off of Monday night games, there's always a little bit of a letdown because you have a little bit less preparation. You're a little bit less, uh, you know, uh, healthy because of the fact you're coming off of a short week. And, guys, remember this, too, in football, okay? And, and I know, I, listen, I'm happy they won. It was fun to see. People are loving reading the positivity. Jared Goff winning, uh, getting nominated for an award. Uh, Riley, um, you know, the kicker, Riley Patterson winning, you know, an award. So, uh, listen, I'm not trying to be negative, but I want to tell you this. In regards to pressure, there was none for the Lions. They're eliminated. So they're just going balls to the wall. Arizona had some pressure. There was some meaning to that game. If they had won, they could have secured more of a chance to win their division. So there is such a dynamic that you have to pay attention to psychologically with the Lions in that they had no pressure. They can fly all over the place. They can jig. They can dag. They can dance. They can have a good time. They have no pressure. They can do whatever the hell they want. They they, they want to uh, F up and have Jackbox kick up. Kick it, no worries. They can do it. There's something to be said for not having any pressure and not giving a fuck. So that's what happened. They got the victory, and I know we're going to hit on the big topic, but it was at least nice to see the Lions kick a team's ass for once in 2021. It was nice to see at least one kneecap-biting performance. Would I have liked to have seen more? Hell yes. But we saw one this year. Hallelujah. It was nice to see. I think you said something really important in that. And it was regarding the identity of this team and how the fan base has basically had this groundswell of now we have an identity. We've got a culture. No, no, you don't. Just just because you won a game against a team that 
regularly underperforms in crunch time. Like go look at the at the at the Arizona Arizona Cardinals uh under Cliff Kingsbury. They struggle. They struggle so much when they have a chance to get into the playoffs or when they have a chance to basically nail down a seed for their season. They just they just buckle. All right. And you're right. The Lions had zero pressure. They went into that game playing with house money. What you are seeing though is you're seeing a team, you're seeing a front office, you're seeing a coaching staff that is starting to show that they can kind of do this, that that the game is not too big for them, that they have the ability to go out and find players. Like you said, there's maybe 10 guys on this roster right now that are coming back here next year for sure. There might be a couple other guys that are thrown in the mix, but in the long run, two, three years from now, are are the majority of these guys that are on this team going to be contributing to this team? Are they going to be giving you valuable minutes and valuable snaps? The majority of this team won't. Honestly, they won't. But like you said, maybe 10 guys on this roster, they'll be here. And they'll be doing things. They'll be helping put the pieces in. They're, these guys, these 10 guys, this is your foundation. This is your groundwork. And that's what you're starting to see. You're starting to see an organization that tore it all down and has come back and rebuilt it, and, and it starts by by putting in the footers, and it starts by putting in that foundation, and then you can build the house on top of that, and that's what you're getting here. These 10 guys that will come back, these will be the 10 guys that are your foundation. These will be the guys who are going to help establish that culture, and I think the, the, the good thing is you're seeing – you're seeing talent from this young rookie class. So that shows you that you've got a GM who can pick talent, who can address talent through the draft, which is what you have to do. You've got to be able to nail the draft so you can add guys to this team and, and get them one on the cheap and to get them for a long time and be able to add that depth. And with the offensive line, and the offensive line is a prime example of a unit that has that has been the strength of this team but has also had the depth because at this point you're just plugging guys in. You're like on your third center right now and you're not really skipping a beat. You're on your, your second and your third right tackle and you're not skipping a beat. So you're able to plug guys in. I mean, you lost arguably one of your best offensive linemen and Taylor Decker for the majority of the season. And you had to flip some things around and you didn't skip a beat. So you're seeing some depth there and you're seeing, you're seeing guys who are, able to to plug in and play which is something that you haven't been able to do as a as an organization for years so there's a lot of good in what you can take out of this win there's a there's an absolute ton but i'll tell you this much i don't think this team currently what you got on sunday that's not who this team actually is this team showed up they played balls to the wall and they gave an incredible effort and look, a lot of these guys could have mailed it in, packed it in uh, weeks ago. All right, you only have two wins on the season. It's hard to show up when when you're getting your butt kicked every single week, and it's hard to show up in the NFL when you're beat up and you're bruised and you're banged up and you hurt. But these guys show up every single week and they play for this coach. That shows that you have a coach who who the players have bought into, which is something you haven't really been able to say around here. So that's that's a huge thumbs up. All right, but this team is not what you've seen on Sunday. This, the, what you've seen on Sunday was a little bit of an aberration. This yes. team is, is not as close to being a complete team that can contend with playoff caliber teams. They've got a lot of work ahead of them. But what you're seeing is you're seeing a team that is doing the work, putting in the groundwork, laying down that foundation so you can build, so you can be a better team. And I think if you're a fan, you should be excited. You should be happy. That was that was a signature win. That was a playoff team. That was a team who who hasn't lost a game on the road. And they came into your house, and you punched them in the face. And you punched them in the face so hard, they struggled to get up off the mat. And they really didn't. And that that's that's a big deal for a guy like Dan Campbell. It's a big deal for this team. And you should be happy about it. But... I'm going to warn you, pump the brakes. You're, you're not a right. playoff team yet. No, no, you still, the number one decision is what's going to happen at quarterback? Who are the wide receivers going to be? Who's going to be off this team? Because potentially, who was the guy that balled out on defense? That's Charles Harris. And one of our writers at SIL Lions did a great deep dive, and he looked at it and he said, potentially speaking, you might have to shell out some cash. You know, are you going to pay Romeo Aquara on one side and then another uh, and Charles Harris, two guys, $10 million each? That, you know, a play, uh, Charles Harris is balling out for himself and for the Lions, you know, and that potentially could draw 
a massive contract offer from somebody else. So you know you could what? Be looking at Charles Harris being gone. This is this is something good too, right? So you look at you remember when the Lions were offering all these free agents and were bringing guys in. And everybody was brought in like a one or two year deal. Everybody was basically brought in on a prove it deal. Like we're going to give you some money, but you got to prove it if you want a bigger contract. If you're going to hang around, you got to prove it. You know, all these contracts basically had outs for the Lions, which was great. These guys have come in and they've proved it. A lot of them have. A lot of these guys are deserving of that other contract. And, and Charles Harris is, is a great example of it. And you're right. Are, are the Lions going to shell out the money to, to bring him back? I don't know. I don't think so. But no, I, I, think, it, I think they're going to make him a nice offer. But I think a team that's looking potentially to take the next step that's a you know, seven-win team looking to get to 11 could make a, a nice, hefty exactly. offer. So exactly. they, and you might not match it. So it's going to be fascinating to see. I'm very curious to see because, man, he can ball out. But unfortunately, that's the toughest part of the job is with uh, J- uh, Brad Holmes. This was one year, but this is also a guy that the, the, the couple of seasons prior was bounced around the league and didn't do much. So uh, is it a scheme fit? Is it something that he can continue to do? So it's, it's always tough when the guy's on the contract year to make that decision. But I, I like what I'm seeing from Brad Holmes. I just, uh, I'm just a little bit curious in regards to what he's going to do at wide receiver because he's kind of, he's kind of whiffed in free agency. Um, but he hit on Amandre St. Brown. He's emerging and he's getting some high praise. So a lot of good things came from it. But yeah, I just think what's, what, what's funny to us as we get older is we don't extrapolate. We're not swinging as wildly. We can sprint and rave and I was happy on the inside that they won the game. It was nice to see, but I'm not extrapolating that. You know, Dan Campbell's the best coach in the history of the world. And, and you saw my funny tweets and, and stuff like that saying, hey, I'm just going to declare that, uh, you know, Dan Campbell's the best coach in the, in the league and, and five teams want him. For yeah. Draft pick. <laughs> that was, that funny. was fun. That, that was, was funny. funny. It is funny because that's what people are doing is they just want to start at, and it, I know it's Twitter, but that's what, they, but it is a resemblance that people are happy and they're starting to extrapolate on the other side. Things that are not going to happen to that degree. It's one win in a season that's crappy, and, and that's not the reaction you should be having. You should be happy that the run game is picking up. You should be happy that um, multiple running backs have the opportunity to potentially succeed. You have players that are getting opportunities that are succeeding. Dan Campbell is getting a little better calling plays, and his aggressiveness is starting to pay off. You're starting to see points getting scored. It's nice to see 30 points, but because I have to tell you, the fans of Detroit, with everything going on, and we've written about it at SIO Lions, and we've talked about it here on the podcast. You said it last week. You were offered free tickets, and you're like, no, nah, I'd rather just go in the backyard and clean up shit and hang out and watch football, too. You're like, That's damn. It. You're like, I'd rather clean up my dog shit and uh, pay my taxes than watch the Lions. I'm like, damn. Again, bad attendance. Only 45,000, less than 50,000, 20,000 empty seats. And the, the attendance is, is the paid number, paid 45000 So with COVID and with the Lions struggling, fans stayed away this year. And they sent the message that, hey, we're not showing out big bucks for uh, potentially uh, a, a team that's going to run the ball 20 times. Now, can you start maybe the last game against the Packers? I think they get in the 50s because the Packer fans are going to come in and just really, they always travel well. It's one of the great teams in the National Football League, but the Lions got to do a lot of repairing too with COVID and with the, uh, and with the, um, nature of the football squad. The fans stayed away this year and, and I'm very, very curious to see how, how, how the attendance will be next year and how this roster is going to look. But I want to ask you, how much did your mindset go to, you know what? They're winning. But should they really be winning? How much tankathon watching did you do? How much did you tell yourself, wait a minute, they just now with a victory have bumped themselves out of the number one spot. And when you look ahead, they're playing two teams that aren't that great this year in the Falcons and the Seahawks. How much did you look and say, "Uh oh, I'm mad that they hurt their draft stock. Are you okay with that they got the win or are you pissed that they potentially are now sitting with the number two spot in the draft. See, I think if this was a a normal draft, right? If this was a draft where at number one you had a a franchise QB, if this was the draft like last year where you could get uh you 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 could get Trevor Lawrence, right? And 
everybody knew like he's going to be the number one guy. Or if this was a draft like two years ago where you ended up drafting third and taking Akuda, and you could have got Chase Young, who would have been your franchise uh, changing edge rusher. If there was a, a franchise changing ed- edge rusher and there was a franchise quarterback at the top of this draft, and you basically went from one to two, I would have been pissed. I'd have been absolutely upset. Instead, they won this game, and I was kind of like, yeah. Like, it, it, the thought crossed my mind. Like, yeah, they just hurt their draft stock. They're going to fall from from number one to number two unless there's this crazy tie in the Houston Jags game, which there wasn't. So they're going to be the, the number two uh, drafting team this year unless something else crazy happens in the next couple weeks. But it's okay. I'm okay with it. What I seen on Sunday made it okay. The fact that I had a team that showed up and played against a playoff caliber team and beat the shit out of them, I'm okay with where they felt. <laughs> also, understanding that Brad Holmes has done a good job already addressing talent and, and procuring talent and picking guys up. And you have to remember, he w- going into last year's draft, he did that on a very short timeline, right? He didn't have uh, a, a whole season to, to really – get into the groove and, and kind of figure out what this team really needed. He was running on a very short window. He's now been at the helm for an entire year. He has he knows who his head coach is and he knows what he needs. He's he's had enough uh uh, uh review of what he's got on the field. He's got he's had enough review of what he has uh with this team and he knows where the shortcomings are. So, I'm okay with them falling from number 1 to number 2. Because there's not that player out there where you're like, that's our franchise quarterback. That's the guy who we can we can pin everything on for the next couple of years. Look, this is a weird draft. All the quarterbacks going into this draft have basically shit the bed. You can get a quarterback if you wanted to, and I would advise them not to do this. You can get a quarterback later on in the first round if you really wanted to. I don't think they're going to be any good. And look, there will probably be one one of five or one of six quarterbacks that will come out this year that that will surprise, and, and you'll be like, yeah, they could have had that guy. But going into this draft right now, after what we've seen in college football, there's not a quarterback I want to draft. Not at number one, not at number two. Now, there are two edge rushers that are at the very, very top that early on in this process – I'm I'm high on both these guys, and I, I think you could do really good things with either one of them. And if there's a guy that you favor a little bit more than another one, it, honestly, at this point, it seems like it's a coin flip between all the teams. And there's no telling what, what the Jags are going to do. Like That's an organization that's a complete and utter mess. You just had your head coach who was finger-banging a chick on the dance floor a couple <laughs> weeks ago. He just yeah. got canned. So like it, it, it's unreal what goes on with, with Jacksonville. So if there's a guy that you really want, there's a good chance that he could fall in your lap. On top of that, if you're one of those guys who's like, I love to trade back, I want to trade back, the value from number one to number two to trade back, the, the, the odds of that happening with you being in the number two seat are a little bit higher because there's such a premium yeah. for that yes. first overall draft pick. The, the premium goes down a little bit. So it you does. can get more draft picks if you wanted to at number two, and you have a better chance to trade. Exactly. There's a silver lining in that there are two quality defensive ends, and mm-hmm. if one team falls in love with Aiden Hutchinson or Kayvon Thibodeau, then potentially they can make a massive offer to the Lions. So there's... Not that much of a drop off, really, from uh, Kayvon Thibodeau to Aiden Hutchinson or the other way around. Now, I do think that a lot of fans maybe really, really are liking the idea of Aiden Hutchinson showing up in a Lions jersey, but you never know. Remember, the thing that you got to worry about is Aiden's got to play two more games. He's got to play elite competition. This could potentially show some people some different things, and, and you never know. Uh, he could I play mean, great. You, you had you had a, you had a great podcast done with with Jake Butt. Jake Butt's yep. a prime example. Going into yep. the draft that Jake Butt was headed into, he was arguably the number one or number yes. two tight end in that draft. And next thing you know, he's playing in a meaningless bowl game, and guess what happens? Boom. Blows up his knee, and his career has never been the same. He's never shown that same promise that he showed that season at Michigan. So the tough part is, is that you don't have to worry because. People are now pointing to the fact that, hey, we got Panay Sewell with the number seven spot. And this is a player that looks like he's going to be really generational and is just balling out 
and is going to get better. That's the scary part. Look what he's doing his rookie year, taking pride in keeping Jared Goff clean and opening up and being part of an offensive line that is establishing a solid, solid running attack. So it's good. I think that everything that happened from that game was nice to see in regards to just executing properly, taking advantage of mistakes, and then when you make a mistake, not letting it crush you. So it was a solid mm-hmm. performance. It was a solid performance, and let's just look at it for the nice quality second win that they got this year and to look at it like, okay, maybe this collaborative effort with Dan Campbell – can potentially, if you get him talent, if you get him high-end talent, if you get him something to work with, then potentially at least it's not going to be a shithole to play for Dan Campbell. That basically was the theme. I think they had one goal this year. Really, it was just make this the fun, happy place that people want to talk about, and that's what it's been. And, and it's just been positive. Everybody loves everybody. Everything's great. And within that, we've, we've criticized the play calling and things like that. But I really think that Dan Campbell said, shit, let me just learn it and, and see if I can apply it at this level. And he's now going to fine tune how much, how much aggressiveness he's going to need to use in big games. So I think his tenure starts in earnest. It starts January 5th, 2022, when he gets time off from the new year, gets back in action, and then he starts going, let me watch this film. Who are we keeping? That's when we recognize that, hey, that it's time to rebuild this. Okay? You stripped it down. You put the youngest roster, one of the young rosters, together. Now you stripped it. You gave us two or three wins this year. Now build it back up and show us something next year. Because you ain't going to get the opportunity to do that again. You mess up on fourth and two next year. Oh, hell no. It's not going to fly in Detroit because people are going to say, okay, you showed us something. You're this leader. You're the, the fun guy. It'll quickly turn to this is, um, you know, a country club and, and, and this is not what it breeds winning success when you have Bill Belichick at the highest levels having some level of discipline and getting back to a long ass winning streak after one off season of spending money. So you look at it and you say, Dan Campbell, the clock is ticking. Let's see what's going on. And let's at least see how they perform against the Falcons and the Seahawks in the next couple of weeks. See, I think it's important for Dan Campbell next year, not so much to have, like you said, that country club feel, but I expect them to win more games. How many? How expect, many you want? I expect the players to play just as hard. He needs. Yes. I need to see the guys. I need to see that locker room playing with that same motivation and playing just as hard next season as they do this year. If you, if that happens, then you know you really have something with Dan Campbell, that he is a Thanks. motivator. Yes. Now, how many wins? Five? Six? Next season? Yeah. Oh, man, come on. This is, like, so early. We don't even know what they're doing with the draft. We don't even know what they've no, got no, no, free no. agents. It, it, I, no, no. Not, I'm not telling you what you expect, but what number, let's just say, okay, they, they have a similar draft. They get five players that add. You add a couple pieces. You add a number one wide receiver. Let's just look at it and say, okay, you're going to go from two wins. What's a reasonable jump? Six, seven? I think five. I, I think five, five. Between five and seven. You have to yes. hit that five and seven. You're still going to have the, the segment that's going to be grumpy, and that's going to be the SOL crowd. But I think five to seven starts gets, getting you in a trend with, with maybe three signature wins and a lot more performances and maybe golf going three games in a row without throwing an interception. So we'll see. What, what have you thought about Jared Goff lately? Yeah. Because the last four games, okay. he's looked unreal. Okay, okay, okay. Let me. Okay, this is how I look at it. The guy is not a college quarterback. He's not a bum. Right. But the, the, so I that's what we were it. calling him early in the season. Though. Right. Right. And you got to remember too, he's learning a new offense. There's a transition. He doesn't have a number one wide receiver. And you got to remember too, the passing attack has been reworked. They have a young hotshot guy in Ben Johnson who has focused on the routes and creating creativity and, and, and reworking it. They recognize, oh, shit, what, what we were doing collectively was terrible. They redid it quickly after the bye, and they've actually added creativity. They've added disguises. The, the Amandra St. Brown plays have been great. So with Jared Goff, here's the thing, though. Here's the problem. I like the fact that he can get the ball to receivers that are open. I like the fact that he can have good games. I just struggled to – I just want to amputate those two legs, and I want to find, you know, like the $6 million man, I want to find two feral legs that can scoot faster because there was a couple plays you saw that 
if he just moved his feet a little bit faster, kind of like speeding Gonzalez, and just move forward, he could gain six yards and help the cause. I want Jared Goff's brain and Jared Goff's professionalism and Jared Goff's uh, understanding of the game, but in a completely different body. It, it, it's just he's not athletic enough. I, that that kind of quarterback, you can pin your ear back and kill him. Like, literally, he'll get killed. Right when they start getting good, uh, a defensive end's going to come and squash him. One mistake, and he's going to go down. He's not mobile. He's a sitting target. And these big dudes, like, you know, uh, a, a 30-pound less version, less muscular Drew Bledsoe is not what I'm looking for. I'm looking for a little bit of that Aaron Rodgers, Patrick Mahomes, where, hey, if the play breaks down, I'm doing the 360 pirouette, and then I just fling the ball down the field 40 yards, and we're looking good. You need that. So I think that Jared Goff, nice quarterback. But then when I extrapolate that into what what, what it can do at the highest levels, I think an NFL defense in the playoffs could pin their ears back and kill him. Just absolutely kill him. And you would have a repeat performance of a Super Bowl where you get to the postseason riding high, offense, boom, you get to the playoffs where things bog down, and he drops six points and lays an egg. Because in the, in the playoffs, you got to get going. But here's the thing. The Lions – are going to potentially make Jared Goff into some kind of version of Trent Dilfer. It's going to be like, when we get to the playoffs, we're going to try to run the ball 40 times. And that's what would happen. I can't wait to see that, that dynamic one day, to see like uh, a team like the Chiefs taking on a team like the Lions, where the Chiefs are a high-powered offense, but you got a team like the Lions that want to play strong defense and want to pound the rock. Kind of that, that kind of old-school mentality versus the new school. And that butting of heads makes for classic storylines and classic football. I like what the Lions are doing, but I also need a little bit more enhancement. And my question to Dan this week was, is there room for more explosiveness? And he says there is. He said there's more chance for some more explosiveness with what's been going on with the Monra and with Jared and with uh, Ben Johnson working together. So, hey, if you, if you can do it, if you can bring a little bit of that explosiveness and, 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 then, and then run the ball, when you run the ball, bro, that's where the run action can really get you, and, and that's what they did. They were able to get a monitor St. Brown open. But in the league, bro, it's tough. NFL defense can, can stop that with a lot of good uh, uh, safety play and a lot of good uh, coverages. So my, my opinion, Jared Goff went from a C to a B-. minus. Let me ask you this. So I'm looking at – uh, I'm looking. I'm looking basically at at this year's draft where we're at right now. So like in a small window, and I'm looking at a draft chart where it gives you value for the picks. Yep. Would you be okay? Because we're talking about the possibility of being able to move out of that number two spot, possibly moving back to acquire more picks. Yeah, trade. So looking at the draft right now. Jets are drafting fourth because I was curious when you said when we were talking about five wins, I was curious where yeah. that would kind of put the Lions as far as the draft because I feel next year they've got to get their quarterback. They somehow have to get their quarterback next year. So you're not going to obviously – you're going to have an extra pick going into the draft because you'll have that one from the Rams. So you will have two yeah. picks have the ability to move up next year. So this year, maybe move back. Mm-hmm. So Detroit sitting at number two. Looking at teams that have multiple first-round picks, the Jets have number four, and they've got number eight currently. Oh. So looking at value-wise, would you give up the number two pick? You'd probably have to throw in a third round, and you might have to give up something else because I don't think the, the value necessarily equates. Uh, but would you give up the second overall pick and a third-round pick to move back and pick up four and pick up eight? Eight. Oh yes, yes. So you'd have three. You'd have three picks in the first round. You would yes. obviously lose your third round pick. But yes, I do you, it all day. I, oh, thank you, Cuz. I now, uh, for those of you that will read the SI All Lions site, that will be probably mock drafted in February. I'll, send, I'll send you a link so you yes. can for the uh, for the trade value chart. Yeah, so I will mock. I will. I will mock draft that. Uh, uh, oh my God, the players that the Lions could get at four and eight. Oh, I think if Brad Holmes is worth a darn and he thinks he can do something with two draft picks in the top ten, yeah, that would be probably very nice. That way you could take a quarterback and not have a problem. You could take Corral at four and then uh, uh, an impact player at eight, and people would still be happy if Corral's a bust. I mean, Bro, they wouldn't be. I would, I would be pissed if they took Corral at four. Uh, he's got like, like, let me put it like this. I don't feel like there's a quarterback this year. Like, I mean, things will change. So as of yeah. right now, when we're, when we're recording this, yeah. just before Christmas, Merry Christmas, everybody, just before Christmas, and we're talking about a, a possible quarterback 
for this team, a franchise quarterback. Right hmm. now, the way it sits, I don't believe there is one franchise quarterback in this draft the way it currently sits. Now, look, like I said before, I think there will be one guy that will pop from this draft because that's usually how it works. The odds are one guy will pop. But right now, I would be so upset if they had two picks in the top ten, actually in the top eight, and they wasted one of them on a, on, a, on a quarterback. I'd be absolutely pissed if they wasted any of those three draft picks on a quarterback, any of the first-round draft picks. I'd be so upset. No, we'll see. Yeah, I, I think there could be a quarterback, but probably in the later rounds. And uh, check out Vito's latest mock draft. He's got a quarterback from Michigan, uh, not the Wolverines, but I believe a quarterback from Michigan to potentially show up for the Lions. Check out Vito's latest three-round mock draft at SI All Lions. By the way, the Lions have the most draft capital of any team as far as points go, as far as, like, the the ratings for the picks go this year. Yeah, I can't wait to see it, man. I can't wait to see how the Lions shake out. Uh, Atlanta, you know, it's Lions-Atlanta in the toilet bowl. Probably nobody's going to care to see it. I'm very fascinated to see how this game shakes out because it could be error-filled. And cuz, guess what? It is so true. And what was the major premise with the Lions in this podcast is whenever something good happens, something terrible always happens. And it's so true. Um, some some famous personalities in town have called it the up-down theory. I just call it that the Lions are, uh, can't handle success. Whenever the football gods notice that uh, some positivity has been bestowed upon the Lions, then something crazy happens. Jared Goff ends up on the COVID list. And you're just like, really? Are you kidding me? So for the tank crowd, they're probably very thrilled. But it appears that Goff probably is not going to play on Sunday. So you could get Tim Boyle. You could get David Blau. It could be a real mess of a situation. So stay tuned. Pay attention to At Detroit Podcast as we update it daily regarding what's going to happen. But you just it just sucks because you just wanted to see Goff a little bit have some momentum that gets built over. But it's not going to happen potentially. I think that. It might be tough to have him go with no preparation, a little bit tired, a little bit with mild sickness, even though it's mild to then suit up and play at the highest level. Just give him a week off and see where you go from there. But speaking of Jared Goff and COVID, bro, the Lions like unleashed Pandora's box, as they say. They got bestowed by it one by one in the secondary. And then cause the NFL, NBA, uh, on Wednesday, Kate Cunningham got in the health and safety protocols. You're seeing it all across the league. It was crazy. Steve Eisenman had a talk, and then, boom, the wings shut down until after Christmas. So I, I'm fascinated, and it was just – see, here's the part that I understand. I understand all sides of it, but the part that we really don't know for those that say, hey, why are we testing people with no symptoms – the scariest part is when you look at, and you and I always do this because we're wise and we always think, what's the worst case scenario in everything? Oh, does the power go out? What happens if our microphones go out? What happens if our system goes out? What happens if Adam doesn't call me? What happens if Adam gets locked out of the house? we got contingency plans. Adam's got keys everywhere so he can record this podcast. I do. I do have exactly. keys everywhere. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Because we think like that. We think like, okay, what's the worst case scenario? Unfortunately, in this case, we don't know who, how do you send somebody with COVID into an extremely physical sport like hockey and then say, go out there and perform. That's the scary part is what about exhaustion? What about uh, heat elevation? What about body temperature? The one thing we don't know, okay, is that how does the human body respond to extreme physical, uh, extreme physical output and exhaustion when you have COVID? So I think that's scary to open that Pandora's box. Now, I respect those that say it because you want to get the games played. You say to yourself, why are we testing so many people? Why are we having it? I think what happens is, and this country is so classic for this, they go from one extreme where nobody gets vaccinated, let's debate getting vaccinated, and then we swing the pendulum completely to the other side where we're saying, fuck it, if they got COVID, let them play. And you're just like, no, 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 that's not the answer either, because you know what could happen. Worst case scenario, there's a dude skating and all of a sudden, boom, he falls down on the ice because of extreme exhaustion. I don't want to I want I want to know if these players have covid, 
You know, but I think the blessing is we now can say that the leagues are doing right things, which is saying once you get tested and you're vaccinated, you don't have to spend four weeks or, or two weeks away from the game. If you test negative, you can get back quickly as soon as five days. And I think that's been the correction that's been right. The rhetoric of let's not test is crazy. I think you sh- I think in the age of testing, test everybody every day. I feel great. Um, I, the one thing with the Lions, and I'll say this, and it's, uh, you know, obviously an organization we rip on a lot, but that's just because we want them to win so bad. But in terms of testing, they've tested my ass every Wednesday for the last five months. And the peace of mind that that gives me is amazing because I live my life and then I know on Wednesday I'm getting tested. So the, the benefits of that, the peace of mind, and it's always a little bit scary on that test day when you're like, oh, shit, because I don't want to get yanked out. But uh, I at least was not going to be first. The, the classic part was the first people to get COVID were the Lions reporters. The Lions team reporters were the first to get COVID from the media. And then one other media member got it. I, I, I want to go the whole year without getting it. But at this point in time, I want testing to be ramped up. It, it, everybody should know what's going on. But I think the, fair, the, the, the thing that the NFL did that was great was they went with the talk of, hey, if somebody's not symptomatic and they're mild and they test positive, then they just got to test, just test negative one time within a couple of days and they can get back in action pretty quickly. But I don't agree with the policy of not testing. I think that's crazy and you're going to potentially get someone really hurt. But I, I think the NHL, when I saw the differences between the two sports, here's the problem with the NHL that's not really relatable to the NFL. We got to deal with Canada. And you know what Canada's like? Canada's like that strict grandma that you walk over to and she won't let you put on the sports channel. She's like, no, no, no. All we can watch here is the travel channel. And we're like, grandma, I I, I don't want to watch the travel channel. She's like, I don't care. We're not watching anything fun. There's nothing that is going to be any kind of talk. So we're not even watching CNN or Fox or we're not watching channel 247. You get to watch the cooking channel or the travel channel. And you're just like, this sucks. I want to go home. Dealing with Canada is like dealing with uh, uh, an extremely different situation. And so with the Canadians dealing with it completely differently, whether you agree it's right or wrong, the NHL is screwed because they're just on the track of canceling shit. And it it stinks, but that's just what it is. And it's only really because they got a rampant spread. It's extremely physical sport and they play on ice and you got to deal with international shit, which just complicates everything. Yeah, see, I think the the way the NFL is handling it, I think, is probably the best. I, honestly, at this point, right, so you're, you're dealing with two leagues that are, are predominantly vaccinated, right? The NFL, I think, is somewhere close to 90 to 93 percent vaccinated. The NHL is basically 99.9, everybody but Todd Bertuzzi vaccinated. And my whole thing is you don't necessarily need to test unvaccinated you don't need to necessarily te- test vaccinated players. If you're showing symptoms, ob- obviously, you need to be tested. And we, the, 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 the symptoms should be pretty strict, right? So, like, if you have a cough, if you've got a runny nose, if you feel fatigued, if you feel tired, it, it, those things you should be tested immediately for. And then if you can return a negative test result, then you're fine. You can go play. But if you're, if you're vaccinated and you're not showing any signs of being sick. I don't necessarily feel that you need to be tested because all it's doing is you're moving guys into this in, into this COVID protocol where it's it's damn near difficult for them to get out. And now because of that, you're you're shutting down large parts of the season or you're moving parts of the season around. I mean, you you look at what took place this past week. We had games that took place on Thursday. You had games that took place on Saturday. Games that were supposed to take place on Saturday ended up taking place on Monday. You had games that took place on Sunday. Games that were supposed to take place on Sunday then took place on Tuesday. It was an absolute clusterfuck. Now, you're right. The way Canada is dealing with it, Canada is extremely strict. I was driving home the other day, and I was listening to CBC Radio because I'm a, I'm a lunatic and a loser. And I'm going to tell you this. I love the Canadians. Canadians are great. They are so polite. They had uh, um, one of the one of the government officials for Nova Scotia on. I don't think it was a prime minister, but it was one of the government officials for Nova Scotia. He was on the radio, and he was basically apologizing to all of the citizens of Nova Scotia because they're they're going right back to where we were roughly a year ago, where 
you, everything's at half capacity. You have to be wearing a mask. Uh, everything has to be stationed out at least six feet apart. And they're, they're, they're ramping everything back up. They're on the verge of going right back into lockdown and they just opened the border, uh, a couple of months ago. So for the NHL, the way the NHL has to deal with everything, you're right. He, Dealing with Canada makes things much more complicated, much more difficult. But all that being said, I think the way the NFL is transitioning, the way the NFL is going, is probably what is best for most leagues. Yes. Because you you don't you shouldn't be putting players who aren't showing symptoms into a COVID protocol, which then impacts your season. And out of all of the sports, the NFL is the one that can't really push anything off. I mean, you've got a set date. Your Super Bowl is, is taking place in the beginning of February, and there is no way you can move that. So you've got to play your games, and you have to get there. There's only one way to do that. And that's by playing all those games. And that's by figuring out who's going to the playoffs and then making it through the playoffs. Yeah. You know, it's 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 not like the NHL. It's not like the NBA where, where these teams own their home courts and games are played there. You can move things around if you have to. So I don't know. I would like to see... I'd like to see it more in line with uh, with the NFL approach. And I get what you're saying. It's like a complete 180 from where we were uh, basically 365 days ago. You know, like then it was like we need to ramp up testing. We need to test everybody. <laughs> everybody needs to test. And now we're like, don't test anybody. No, Screw no, but it. Treat it like it's the flu or treat it like it's the cold. It's just whatever. <laughs> yeah. uh, let the player self-report. And you're like, uh, okay. No, no, we don't want to do that. <laughs> you know, so I, I get it. I get what people's reactions are. They're, they're, um, the phrase that everybody's used is COVID fatigue, and you, you're now hearing it every day. And the good thing about us is we, we, we bring it up with the big players, but we don't bring it up so much so that we want to be a distraction with the podcast and SI. So the thinking is is that just keep everybody safe, let everybody be aware of their situation, and uh, as long as the mindset is to keep everybody in the clear and to keep players doing the right thing, get their boosters, and to consider really solid backup plans, but they're playing come hell or high water, and you have to realize it's a business, and you can't shut down the business in this day and age, especially with the economy, and you have to take that into account, you know, and it's just, you can't extrapolate real life to sports. It's just different. You can't say, well, I don't, show up, to, I don't show up to my work and not get tested. Yeah, but then when, the, when, the, when, when you fucking end up finding out that you're not there, you, when you, you end up finding out you got COVID, you don't go to work. You know, you don't go, uh, you say you automatic 14 day quarantine until you, you feel better. But the, the vaccines made things a little bit easier for us to kind of figure out when people can come back. So we'll see how it evolves and, and things like that. You know, I'm just waiting for the next variant to come out and see how, <laughs> see how that ravages. I, I like the name though, Omicron and uh, Delta. You know, what's the next variant that's going to fuck us all up? You know, do you know what story showed up on Channel 7 today, which was hilarious and it made me laugh. What are the odds that one single human can get both the Delta and the Omicron variant at the same time? And I, <laughs> and I was just like, it's, I don't think it's that high, but it's like a situation in which the COVID situation has wrecked and wreaked havoc on everybody and has made everybody a little bit more um, aware of their health. But number one thing, too, and, and I'll say this, focus on your health, focus on your mental health. You can fight COVID if you're healthy. Get those zinc pills in, eat your vitamins, uh, eat well, exercise. And with the combination of good health and vitamins and supplements and, and, and stuff like that, you can beat COVID. That's what we should be encouraging is because, look, all these athletes are surviving. Nobody's in the hospital. So number one thing, the blessing is the fear of death, I think, has been subsided. But we just have to realize how we can best adapt with living with COVID than it is to – kind of ignore it and act like it's not there. So that's what we're going to do is be aware, be mindful of everything, but stay wise and stay healthy, everybody. Enjoy your cocktails. The blessing is I get to see Adam this weekend and have a great time and really enjoy everything that's going on with everybody. Yes, I definitely appreciate podcasting with Adam. I could spend my time doing anything, and I know for sure that at least a couple hours a week, I'm going to talk shit with my boy, and we're going to laugh. We're going to tell jokes. We're going to wild out in the world of Detroit sports, and you guys have made us a, a small part of the community, and you guys have allowed us to, you know, 
really have a good time with talking sports in our own way. That's the number one thing that makes me proud is Adam and I are who we are. We're not conforming. We're not changing. I'm John, and he's Adam. And forever and a day that we'll turn this fucking thing off is if anybody says, hey, do it this way. We did it how we wanted, however we wanted, and that's the game we played. And uh, to have my cousin with me along for the ride this entire time, has been amazing. Over 430 episodes deep, weekly podcasts. And if you check out the video that Jake bought that I posted on, he had a great saying on there. He said, when Jim Harbaugh was running those four-hour practices, he's like, everybody said they wanted to be great. But when hour three came and the time was to transition to hour number four, who was going to step up? Anybody can start a podcast, but are you going to stick with it? Are you going to put out consecutive podcasts? Are you going to grind? Are you going to do what it takes to be successful? And I know the guy opposite of me has worked as just as hard as I have to make this as fun as possible. And to grind with him is the absolute pleasure to have every podcast archive so that when we're old and gray, we can say, look, look at the stupid ass shit we said about COVID when we were kids. And uh, forever and a day, I'm always grateful for this podcast. It's a huge part of my life. Talking to Adam is a huge part of my life. I get to have a great opportunity to enjoy broadcasting in our own way and to kick the walls down and to have, you know, an opportunity to have fun with things. It makes it great. So you you better. I only have one Christmas wish, and that's follow Adam on Twitter at Adam R S Tarot Z. Follow the network at Detroit Podcast. Lop off a tweet to us. Let us know something. Tell us something. You like us. You don't like us. You like Doc. You hate Doc. Let us know what you're thinking. Cuz, Merry Christmas. I got to ask you. Yeah. What's the present that'll just make you mark out? What's the present this year that's going to make you go, wait a minute. That would be fucking awesome to get. That's a good question. Here's the thing. I didn't ask for anything this year. Yeah, nobody like, asked for it. Well, we're not I, late I know, 30s. But like, what do we like, ask for? Like, like Alyssa and I, we ended up just going halvesies on a snowblower. That, that's, that's Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> hey, um, dude, that's major. That helps. Oh no, yeah, no, for sure. Uh, and I haven't told you this, but like I've been dealing with like with a crazy messed up back. I ended up tearing a disc in my back about oh. three months ago, so I've been dealing with that. So yeah, snowblower is going to come in super handy. I don't Hell know, yeah. man. That's a okay. good question. I oh. think I think let's let's revisit this uh, next week when we do this, and I'll tell okay. you what I marked out for because that's a good okay. question. I have no idea. Okay, you know, no, we're not. Yeah, well, I'll put it on Twitter. Uh, today we're recording this. Christmas will be Saturday. So look for a tweet on on on, uh, on Friday where we kind of ask, what's the best present you ever got? Because yeah, I'm thinking the same thing. You mark out for a little bit of, of things, but I'm, I'm curious to see what you think. Because this podcast, this hour flew by. Thank you so much, guys, for downloading. Anywhere you find your favorite podcast, type in Detroit Sports Podcast, and you can find it. And, and, and thank you to those. Really, just as we're recording this, somebody said, hey, awesome interview with Jake Butt. It means a lot. It means a lot to us when you say that. Just that little bit of recognition will fuel me for the next two, three years. And everybody's along for the ride. We love it. Thanks, Cuz. Another great podcast in the books. I can't wait to fire this up again next week. Let's do this again on the latest edition of Doc and Jock.